Hey. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about sec founding secure computation on blockchains, and this is joint work with Whipple and Abhishek. So what is the main motivation for it? Blockchain. The existence of blockchain, whether irrespective of your uh, you know, individual views on its existence, it exists. And more uh, concretely for us, we want to examine the foundation of secure computation in the existence uh, in the context of blockchains. So what does that mean? Now, parties no longer just communicate with each other when they run a protocol, but they also exchange messages with the blockchain. So what does this mean? So we want to ask the question, which is, what change does this make to the study of protocols in this setting, if any? Right? And the first step in this process is obviously going to be establishing a model. And there's been this really, really nice line of work recently which captured you know, the essence of blockchains and actually proved that under certain assumptions, these blockchains actually satisfy this property. And this is the work you know, uh, starting with uh, this work in 2016, and it's still sort of ongoing. But for this talk, I'm going to consider a very, very simplified model. And it, it will suffice, you know, the main ideas and challenges in this work can be illustrated in this really simple model. And you'll see that this model is, you know, sort of unrealistic in some sense. But I should point out that in our paper, we actually consider the full realistic model. OK, so what is the model? So the model assumes this oracle, which I'll call the blockchain oracle. And it also has an additional timer with some parameter delta. So the delta here is to sort of indicate the average time you know, blocks are created in a blockchain. So over time, uh, parties send messages to the oracle. And after completion of this delta, this, uh, you know, this oracle collects all the messages, along with some identifying information, sends it back. Right? And now we require some certain properties from this blockchain. So what are some of these properties? One is we want the, all parties to have a consistent view of the blockchain. Next, we want that if messages are sent, they should appear immediately on the next block. And then the third property is that only the oracles can create blocks. Again, this is a super idealistic uh, version of the blockchain. In the paper, we consider a more realistic model. Cool. So we're talking about something what we call a blockchain hybrid model. And what does it mean? I'll say a party is blockchain active if it can sort of read and write to the blockchain. Sure. Now, when establishing the model, an important thing I really I need to note is that the simulator has the same access to the blockchain as every other party. This is in contrast to some other recent work where the simulator can potentially even rewind the blockchain and so on. So this gives the blockchain, in the case where the simulator can rewind, sort of a local flavor of the blockchain to the protocol, while in our setting, the blockchain is sort of global, wherein other protocols and other things can also use the blockchain, independent of this. All right, great. So I'm going to state our results, first in terms of, of a zero knowledge, and then more general secure computation. So for zero knowledge, we show that if only the adversary is blockchain active, then black box zero knowledge is impossible. Then we show you know, in the positive result that if we mandate all parties to somehow use the blockchain, and we see how, that we can actually uh, have a zero knowledge protocol in this setting. So this is a super constant round protocol. And in fact, this is tight. And we show that a constant round black box zero knowledge in this model is impossible. So for this talk, I'm going to focus only on the first two. And you, know, you can see the paper for the impossibility result. So moving on to more, secure, more general secure computation, we, show, uh, we sort of overcome the impossibility and show that concurrent secure computation is possible uh, in this setting. Uh, but you know, not everything is all rosy. We also show that universally composable commitments are impossible in this model. Sure. So again, I'm going to focus only on the positive result in this setting. So the main thing I want you to take away from this talk is that in context of uh, you know, secure computation, the blockchains have both you know, destructive and constructive use cases. OK, so let's jump right in. And I'm going to start with zero knowledge and you know, a very, very quick overview of the definition of zero knowledge. 
So here I have a prover and a verifier, and the prover wants to prove membership of some statement X. And it does so by exchanging messages of the verifier, and there are some properties that typical protocols require. One is completeness, meaning that if the statement is actually uh, in this is a member, then the prover can convince the verifier of this. Uh, the second is if the statement is not a member, then no matter how the prover behaves, it shouldn't be able to convince the verifier other than with some really small probability. Okay? And the third is when the verifier is trying to cheat, where it's trying to sort of glean some information uh, from the prover that it doesn't already have. And this is defined with respect to an ideal world where only the verifier exists, but not the prover. And this is formalized by saying, you know, if there exists some uh, entity called the simulator, which has the same input as the verifier. It doesn't get the additional input that the prover does. And it's able to somehow generate a transcript that looks the same to the verifier. So the verifier is now sort of able to learn any information by itself that it could have learned from the prover, thus establishing this property of zero knowledge. But now in our setting, we sort of have this blockchain looming over us and the protocol, this definition just to indicate that. So what about the impossibility? So in terms of black box uh, protocols, uh, the advantage a simulator in the black box setting has over a regular prover is that the simulator is able to rewind the verifier or an adversary. It's able to make the adversary go back in time. Right? And so the main idea here is to construct a verifier that prevents a simulator from rewinding. So the idea is really simple. Right? So every time uh, the verifier has to send a message, it takes the transcript so far, puts it onto the blockchain, and then waits for a response. Once the response arrives with the message, it checks if there's a different transcript for the same session already on the blockchain. So for a simulated, uh, for a simulator to be able to rewind, there must be at least two partial transcripts of the same session on the blockchain. Right? So the verifier will never respond uh, to the prover if it finds another session. So this prevents the simulator from ever being able to rewind the blockchain in this setting. Know that here, only the verifier is using the blockchain. The prover is sort of oblivious to the existence of the blockchain. So this is going to be an important point, where we show that it's impossible if only the adversary is blockchain uh, active. Sorry, and, But if all the parties are blockchain active, then we actually show some positive results. So the structure of the zero knowledge protocol follows this uh, you know, preamble approach uh, from Prabhakar and Rosen Sahai. And specifically, it has these sort of three stages. The first is the verifier committing towards a challenge. And the second is uh, what we're going to call extraction opportunities or slots. This is to sort of enable uh, a simulator to, be ex to extract the challenge that the verifier commits to. And the last phase is going to be the proof system. You know, concretely, you can think of it as like the Hamiltonicity proof system or something like that. So why do we enforce this structure? This structure is useful because it gives you the simulation guarantee that if you're able to extract the challenge in even one of these slots, then the rest of the protocol can be simulated in a straight line manner. No more rewinding. Right? So if I'm able to rewind once during this uh, during these slots, then I don't have to bother with rewinding any time in the future. OK, so let's look at how this protocol could potentially work. So now we have the blockchain, and the main idea is to use the blockchain as a course timer. So what does that mean? That means every party is going to have a, you know, a timer with some parameter, timeout parameter k, and every time sort of a block comes, it's going to count down on the timer. And then it's going to run the protocol. So for instance, OK, I should note importantly that parties are not required to post anything on the ledger. right? So the use of the ledger in this protocol is only going to be read. So for instance, say this, they run this first slot, and a block appears. Both of them add it. And the second block appears, so on. And say now the third block appears. Here I'm assuming the verifier is cheating, so it hasn't updated its local state. But the prover sees, OK, my timeout was three, and there are three blocks here. I'm done. And the verifier hasn't completed, so I'm going to abort. So the question is, why is this useful? How does this help us? So we want to 
sort of recall the impossibility, we want to stop the adversary from preventing uh, rewinding, right? So co concretely, let's think of the case where you have four slots and a timer, timeout of three. And then if the protocol actually computes, you're going to have potentially less than three blocks. So the yellow arrows indicate you know, a block appearing during the execution of the protocol. And now I'm going to call the blocks where the slots where a block appeared as bad and the slots where the block didn't as good. Right? Now I have two good slots where the adversary is not waiting on a block. Right? Now I can potentially rewind the adversary to my heart's content, extraction, done. So are we done, though? And it turns out there is a really small, subtle issue which shows up you know, in the context of this setting is that of timing leakage. What does that mean? So it means that you know, simulation typically takes time larger than the running time of the adversary, of the honest execution of the protocol. So in, for instance, concretely think of this really bad case where the actual execution runs, it maybe takes you know, one block duration in the blockchain world, but while simulating it, it takes three blocks duration. And like this is now trivially distinguishable by a distinguisher who has access uh, to the blockchain, right? So the important point to note is that the time the simulator takes to complete simulation and the number of computation steps that the simulator takes are slightly different, right? So now what we can hope to do is, if it's parallelizable, do some of these uh, you know, computation steps in parallel, and then hopefully there is no timing leakage. And this is exactly what we do. So we have uh, this notion of a main execution, and we have the notion of an, a rebound execution. And note that these are run in parallel. And I've uh, indicated by the height to be the duration that the verifier takes to respond to the challenges, uh, or the execution of the slot. And note that even for the same slot in the rebound execution, the verifier can potentially take longer. And what's the main difference between the main execution and the rebound execution is that the main execution, you isolate the adversary from the blockchain, meaning any query that it sends to the blockchain, you don't send it. Anything that the blockchain sends, you don't send to the adversary. So what does this mean? So if I have potentially blocks coming from the blockchain, I know that in these blocks on the rebound execution, the adversary is expecting a blockchain, a block, rather. So these are all bad slots. Now I'm guaranteed there's at least one good slot, and I can rewind. Right? And this is pretty much all we needed. Right? Once we get one slot where we can rewind, we're done. So it turns out that for a simulation to for extraction to succeed, we need at least super constant many slots, which in turn means we need super constant many rounds. And unfortunately, this turns out to be tight, and we show in the paper that there does not exist a constant round protocol in this setting with black box simulation. I should note that there are some similarities, uh, superficial similarities to the timing model where parties have a synchronized clock and you ha and like have delays to make protocols work. But there are slight differences in the setting. In the timing model, the simulator can control the clock. Here, sort of, there's an unforgeable clock from the blockchain. And in their timing model setting, the adversary can be rewound at any point. And, but here, we have this notion of safe and unsafe. And this requires, actually, new rewinding techniques. OK, moving on to concurrent self-composition. So what is secure computation? A really, really quick overview. Parties jointly want to compute a function of their private inputs. They communicate. And at the end, everybody gets their output. So how do you define security? Security is defined with respect uh, to an ideal world, where everybody sends their inputs to an ideal party. And the ideal party computes the output and sends it to them. So you say that for every, corrupt, every set of corrupt parties executing the protocol, there exists a simulator that corrupts the same set of parties. And the views are sort of indistinguishable. You don't need to really know what the exact definition is to proceed. But again, to note, we have a looming blockchain. So let's consider uh, three protocol executions. These are the transcripts of the execution uh, of the same protocol with potentially different inputs. So I consider this uh, notion of only self-composition, where it's only the same protocol that's being run, as opposed to you know, general composition, where I might have protocol A and protocol B messages. And 
The self-composition allows for arbitrary interleaving. So I can concurrently arbitrarily interleave the messages. And why is this model interesting? It turns out that it's impossible in the plane model. So uh, what do we do? Uh, the prior work typically takes the, uh, you know, there are some weaker security notions, or alternatively, you establish some trust assumptions. In our setting, we construct a protocol in the blockchain model. So what does that mean? It means that our protocol works in a sort of decentralized trust assumption. Right? So it's not like we're somehow overcoming the impossibility. We're showing that it is uh, possible to construct a protocol, and this implies that you know, it's sort of in the de decentralized trust assumption. OK. So just quickly to summarize why uh, the impossibility holds. It was initially showed by Lindell in 2004 that it's impossible in the black box setting. And this impossibility was extended to the non-black box setting and you know, various other models. So the basic idea is this. If I think of blue as one protocol execution and green as the other, say I need to rewind uh, at this point. And the adversary at green has committed to its input. But the problem is now when I rewind beyond the input commitment phase, the adversary can potentially change the message or change its input. And this leads to a whole lot of problems during simulation, and it's something that we want to avoid. And I'll come back to this point in a bit. OK. So the structure for our concurrently secure computation to identify what we need is based off these uh, you know, works in weaker models. And the protocol works like this. Most of this is sort of immaterial, but I'll focus on the important part. So I have some notion of a trapdoor generation. I have a commitment phase. I have coin tossing, and then the actual protocol. And it turns out that it's sufficient to build uh, an, a commitment scheme that's concurrently extractable. And once I do that, the rest of the protocol, as before, can be sort of simulated in a straight line manner, and I don't need to rewind anywhere else. So the point is that I now need to build this concurrently extractable commitment scheme. And the structure is the same as something that you've seen before when I talked about the zero knowledge protocol. I have a commitment, initial commitment phase, where uh, the committer commits to a message. And as before, I have these extraction opportunities or slots. Okay. So remember, the, the impossibility stemmed from the fact that you were rewinding beyond uh, the sort of uh, the input commitment of a party. Now, intuitively, I'm going to sort of commit to the blockchain. Right? So if I commit to the blockchain, there's in one, one would hope that there's no way of going beyond it, because now I've committed something to a blockchain. I can't change the value that I committed to the blockchain. So the idea is this. Now, the committer, the first message, which is the commitment, sends it to the blockchain, waits for a block to be created. Now, both the committer and the receiver have this commitment. right? Now, as before, they have this timer, and they start the execution of the protocol. The rest of it is identical as in the zero knowledge case. But how do we extract? Remember now, because it's, we are in the setting of concurrent execution, uh, the slots itself might be split over multiple rounds. right? And now they might be interleaved with other slots. And rewinding one slot could potentially lead to rewinding other slots, and so on. And this leads to an issue. Okay? And to solve this, we look uh, to this uh, you know, really, really nice work in this sort of independent setting or a different setting by Goya, Lin, Pandey, Pass, and Sahai. And they talk about extraction in the presence of a constant number of external messages. They show that if you have a constant number of external messages, then you can con construct a concurrent, secure, uh, concurrently extractable commitment scheme. Right? And that's great. Like, can we now apply this to our setting? We have uh, you know, the external messages are now messages from the blockchain. And now we're uh, trying to extract while we have the blockchain. And remember, we can't go beyond, we can't rewind beyond any of the blockchain messages because you know, the blockchain is fixed. But it, unfortunately, it turns out that the number of messages that uh, the protocol execution gets from the blockchain are not constant. In fact, you know, we can only weakly bound it by the number of uh, protocol executions that are running in the concurrent setting. So our main challenge, which unfortunately I won't have time to go over, is to show how this sort of robust extraction lemma extends to the setting where 
we have this blockchain where there are potentially non-constant many number of messages. And to sort of conclude, uh, I've shown you sort of protocols that the destructive uh, nature in the sense that you know, general protocols that we know don't extend to the blockchain setting. And then we have these constructive protocols where I've shown you, OK, a uh, zero-knowledge protocol that actually works. And in fact, we are able to sort of overcome some impossibility result in the concurrent composition setting. And we actually can give a protocol in the blockchain model. And that's it. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Questions? So these external messages that come from the blockchain in your uh, construction, uh, do they have like do they need to have some structure? Like is it like some actual part of the, or is it just any message, any message from the blockchain? Um, oh, so for us, we assume that the blockchain oracle sends messages only periodically, and it's identifiable as you know blockchain messages. So I can't force them in the simplified model, at least. Yes. So, and actually, this is also for the zero knowledge protocol. You sort of just use the blockchain as a timer. Uh, yes, for the zero knowledge protocol, we use it only as a timer. But for here, you actually have to post a message to the blockchain. So, can't you, like, wouldn't it also make sense to use the blockchain also, like, for some kind of computation in the protocol? Uh, like, sure. I mean, so we want to use it in a, in a minimal sense, right? We're just saying, okay, the blockchain exists. We are talking about the most general setting. You know, this is in an idealized world. This is what one would hope a blockchain gives you. We don't know about. You know, can you do computation on the blockchain? Maybe it's and sort of orthogonal. Why doesn't? Why shouldn't the simulator be allowed to rewind the blockchain? Because okay, so it that's more of a uh, different philosophy in the sense that if you can allow the simulator to rewind the blockchain, but then the blockchain can be only used by the protocol that the simulator is simulating, right? Because if you're sim rewinding the blockchain, it can't be used by another, you know, something, some other party because now it's seeing the blockchain roll back. So you want the blockchain to be global in the sense that I'm using the blockchain to do this, but other parties elsewhere in the world are also using the blockchain to do something. So I don't want the simulator to be able to rewind the blockchain. Uh, do you yeah. have any restriction on the blockchain, or you can use even a Bitcoin blockchain to run your protocol? Um, so this follows from these modelings of the blockchain that as long as you know the protocol satisfies these certain properties that the you know these uh, recent works show as modelling of the blockchain, it's sufficient for us. It's like for instance, do, don't you have a space issue because if many players want to write and there is a block size that is limited? Sure, those are those are potential issues that we sort of don't ignore and assume that you know what how many ever messages unlimited. are every block is unlimited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we assume the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Let's back uh, thank the speaker again.